For hundreds of years, the Bible has been the subject of much criticism. Some say that it's full of contradictions and historical errors. Others say that it's full of myths and legends and old wives' tales. Moreover, some would argue that parts of the Bible are flat-out offensive to modern secular beliefs. Being our source of faith in Christian life, how confident should we be in it? And what reasons do we have to trust in the Bible this ancient book, knowing that it is indeed God's Word. With no further ado, please be on your feet. We'll be reading from 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 to 21. And the Apostle Peter says, For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born from heaven, for we were with Him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy has ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, Jesus said that your word is truth. And it is the truth that sanctifies. It is the truth that saves. We live in a day and age where the Bible is being challenged. People are making it optional. Matter of fact, some people are making it the villain. But we are here today hungry for more of your revelation and we pray that the Holy Spirit minister to us. Give us confidence. Give us courage that we may boldly proclaim what your word says no matter what culture dictates. Let your name shine today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please take your seats. I'd like to call this message the reliability of Scripture. Before I do that, I would, uh, I would like to do a quick recap of the two things we learned last week. First, Christians are to be constantly reminded to pursue Christ-likeness. I talked about the ministry of reminding, a rather unpopular ministry, but it is, it is essential to our growth and fruitfulness as a church. Second, Christians are to rely on Scripture for both truth and encouragement. In today's passage, the Apostle Peter zooms in on God's revelation through Jesus Christ, whose transfiguration was witnessed by Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John. Now, the three disciples' experience is a confirmation of the fulfilled prophecies in the Old Testament and through Christ. Now, the writer knows that more prophecies are yet to be fulfilled when Jesus returns to rule the earth. Two points for today. First chapter would be verses 16 to 18. We're going to focus more on eyewitness account. So these two points will give us greater confidence in the Bible and hopefully give us courage 
to talk about it more, even when people don't want to. So in verses 16 to 18, Peter focuses on Jesus' transfiguration. And that event is recorded in all of the synoptics. I'm referring to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That's found in Matthew 17, Mark 9, and Luke chapter 9. It's quite noticeable how Peter changes his pronouns from, from I to we. If you remember the last passage we talked about last week, he was referring to himself, but now he is including himself with uh, the rest of, of Jesus' inner circle of disciples. It's also interesting that those who were present at this event, Peter, James, and John, none of them wrote about that event. Did you notice that? That said, Peter is one of the witnesses who certify that what they said about the transfiguration is true and factual. He says that he and his peers did not follow cleverly devised myths. He is probably referring to, to fables about Roman and Greek false gods. So today, if we are fighting against indifference and postmodernism, during their time, it was polytheism, many gods. So I was wondering, why would Peter say something like this? It appears that the false teachers of Peter's time were claiming that Jesus' incarnation, his crucifixion, and resurrection were not true historical events, but only made-up stories. For example, two men listed in the book of 2 Timothy named Hymenaeus and Philetus claimed that the resurrection had already taken place. That's why in chapter 2, which I think is the climax of this, of this book, you're going to see Peter writing in a very direct and vivid manner as he describes the false teachers of his time. We'll be talking about that a couple of weeks from now. Be sure to be here if you want to arm yourselves on how to spot a false teacher. Now, contrary to the false teacher's baseless claims, the assertions of Peter and the rest of the apostles are based on real-life events. At the Mount of Transfiguration, in the Bible, it is mentioned as Mount Tabor, T-A-B-O-R. Peter, James, and John saw Jesus' face shine like the sun and his clothes become as white as light. And they heard God say, This is my Son, whom I love, in him I am well pleased. That was an audible voice that all three men heard. But not only did the disciples see Jesus' glory, but they also heard the Father affirm who Jesus is. So take note of the senses that, they are, that Peter is using here. The sense of sight and second, the sense of hearing. These things are very important in terms of uh, witness accounts, eyewitness accounts. So this was an audible statement heard by the witnesses as God the Father, whom Peter refers to as majestic glory, expressed his affirmation of the Lord Jesus by speaking of Christ's glory, honor, and majesty. It kind of gives me the same vibes when I read Hebrews 1, when the writer quotes God the Father calling Jesus my Lord. But more than just seeing Jesus' glory and hearing the Father's voice, the three apostles were physically there. They were there to witness this marvelous event. 
Now, this statement adds another layer of reliability to Peter's claim of speaking the truth. From, a, from, a, from an end time perspective, the transfiguration was a foretaste of the power of Christ to be displayed all over the earth. Here's what I'm thinking, church. The glory that the disciples saw was not Jesus' full glory. You know why I think that? It's because the Bible says that it is impossible for a human being to see God's face and continue to exist. I mean, God's light is so bright, it's deadly. So I'm thinking when Jesus saw his some, somewhat Shekinah glory, that was probably one or five or seven percent of his actual glory. He toned it down a little bit to make sure that those folks will live to tell the story. Peter seems to mean that Jesus is coming a second time was a key component of the gospel that he and the rest of the apostles preached. In fact, when you read Peter's preachings found in Acts 3 and 10, you will see Peter is portraying Jesus, predicting that he is going to return to judge the living and the dead. Bottom line, Peter is saying here is that they should look beyond Jesus' incarnation, his being a human, and look forward to his glorious return. Point number one, the reliability of Scripture should lead us to put our trust in Christ. How many of you here, you just love to wait? Like you enjoy waiting. I don't. I don't enjoy waiting. That's why I'm so glad that I live in the 21st century, that fast food and internet are here, right? Because to some of us, waiting can leave us dazed and confused. When we wait for far too long, we may find ourselves tired and weary and sometimes even unsure. And if we're being honest, even our faith can be shaken by long interludes. It's like listening to a song and the guitar solo is like five minutes. And you've been praying, make it stop already. Just sing. That's what happened during Peter's time. A lot of people, a lot of people were no longer sure whether or not Jesus was a, was a real historical figure, whether he was coming or not. They may have seemed to believe Christ at first, but now they no longer do. They thought that it's been too long, and yet Jesus had not yet come back. So they concluded that he is never coming back. Maybe some of us here share the same thought. They've been waiting for years and years for the Lord's return. And some of us are probably getting a little jaded. But our experience of waiting does not mean that the Bible is not reliable. Neither does it mean that God changed His mind and His Word has lost its power. So friends, I challenge you, instead of losing patience, we should take the time, while we're waiting, take the time to investigate, review the accounts, and see for ourselves that we have in our hands the Bible, God's very Word. And the Bible that we have now is the unadulterated account of actual historical events. These things took place. They happened. But the reliability of biblical records serve a higher purpose. For us readers to examine the reports 
Are these factual? Are Jesus and the apostles telling the truth? Or are they not? If we don't think that they're, that they're telling the truth, then we should all stop reading the Bible. But if all the evidence is pointing to the fact that Jesus and his disciples are telling the truth, we should find the Bible truthful and reliable, and there should be no doubt in our minds that this is indeed God's word. John 20, verse 31. But these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in His name. Can I hear an amen? That is, to me, the second most important verse in the book of John. It took me three years to study the book of John. And the two verses that, that, um, that come first on my list would be John 3.16, number one, and this is number two, because it gives me certainty that what I'm reading is an actual historical documentation of actual events. They happened, they took place, and one of those witnesses was there to write these down. That's why I'm thankful. I'm thankful that our faith is not based on myths and legends. Our God is a glorious, all-powerful, almighty, all-knowing God who revealed Himself to mankind. And 2,000 years ago, He became a human being, flesh and bone and blood, just like you and me. And he lived with people like us. And those people witnessed his glory and his humanity. The men who wrote the very verses we're reading today gave up their lives for what they thought and believed to be true. But the question today is this. Do you believe that the Bible is reliable and that you should therefore entrust your life and soul to Jesus? In other words, does Jesus deserve your faith? Yes or no? Second part. Verses 19 to 21, inspired prophets. And here's our last point. The reliability of Scripture should give us confidence that God inspired biblical writers to accurately record His words. That's a lot. Peter was given an amazing amazing experience to see Jesus in his glorified form. Now, this experience reminded him of how God spoke to the men in the Old Testament through the prophets, through the prophets. He saw the transfiguration as the fulfillment of the words recorded by the Old Testament prophets. And all of these things, they point to one future reality, the coming kingdom of the Lord Jesus. And then the apostle challenges his readers to pay close attention to the prophet's message, which he compares to a lamp shining in a dark place. Kind of reminds me of Psalm 119. Your word is a lamp unto, unto my feet and a guide unto my path. Right? Right? Okay. They're still a weak Lord. Amen. He seems to refer to, to God's word giving hope to a world darkened by moral corruption. Now he tells them to cling to God's word until the day dawns. And I'm thinking this is a figure of speech, a reference to the second coming of the Lord Jesus, whom Peter refers to as the morning star. Let's talk about that term a little bit, morning star. When you look it up in the original language, you will find the word phosphorus. Phosphorus. 
it means light bringer. It refers basically to the planet Venus, which often appears just before daylight. But I don't see any reason for, for Peter to use this term to refer to the planet Venus. So I, I say that the context implies that Jesus is in view right here. Jesus is the morning star. In fact, both the Old Testament and the New Testament record that the Messiah is called morning star. You can go to Numbers 24, 17 and Revelation twenty two sixteen for additional references. Now, the return of the Messiah should motivate Peter's readers to keep the prophetic word in their hearts, treasure it, because it will serve as a light in the midst of darkness. And now Peter defends the reliability of the Old Testament scriptures. And the first thing his readers need to know is that these prophecies did not come from the prophet's own interpretation. Now that term is a little bit challenging to, to understand, and scholars and commentators have all sorts of, of interpretation to this one. But I think based on what the context shows us, Peter is saying that no one should interpret a prophetic word randomly, but how the Holy Spirit intended, intended that word to be understood in light of the rest of scriptures. In other words, the Bible interprets the Bible. If you're having a hard time understanding one passage, we have to find out if there are parallel verses that can help us better understand it. Last week, I mentioned a number, and I want to make a clarification. According to a recent study, here's what they did. So they, they created a computer program that tracks down cross-references in the Bible. And they say that there are about 63,776 cross-references throughout the 66 books of the Bible. What does that tell me? What does that tell you? It means if there's one part of the Bible you don't understand, all you have to do is find its relative. Like if you're new here, and you want to know somebody from Cecil Lake or Flat Rock or Goodlow, you just got to ask Lauren and you'll get the answer. You go to the source, our local historian right there, my history buddy. That's what Peter is trying to, to, to tell us here. The Bible interprets the Bible. Okay, now, this, this view is further strengthened in verse 21. Peter explains that the prophets did not invent their own ideas and prophetic word is not the result of man's specific or speculation or imagination. Instead, the biblical writers were, and I quote, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. Carried along, passive voice. They were not the doers. It was the Holy Spirit. But here's the thing. The Bible is not clear as to how God directed the writers to write Scripture because some say that they were, passive, they were passively used by God he, as if God was dictating the very words that, they, that He wanted them to write, to write down. But Peter shows us here that the prophets spoke from God. He's not denying their, their individuality. And when you read the Bible, you can see the unique features of each book. Each writer has his own, own style, vocabulary, and experience. Now, the prophets wrote, but God worked in them that what they wrote was His word. And we can, we can have all day discussing this, what kind, of, what kind of inspiration God gave us, but we don't have that time, obviously. But here's the thing. We can say 
that God inspired the writers using their own language, vocabulary, and experiences in linguistic style to write down what he wanted them to write down. And Paul says the same thing. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 to 17. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Throughout the ages, the Bible has confounded millions and millions of minds. Some of them were skeptical, believing that it was, was written only by humans during a time of superstitions, cruelty, and ignorance. Some of them refused to believe it because, according to them, it is replete with contradictions, bad advice, and terrible laws. Earlier this morning, we, we went through the passage talking about, about Amnon and Tamar. It was a sad, sad story. But that's one of the reasons why we should read the Bible and trust it. Because if it's a made-up story, why would God let that passage put in there? Still others say that it's hard to put one's trust in the Bible because it has been translated far too many times. And there's no sense in that argument. Red is pula in Tagalog. Bell, what's red in French? Rouge, like Moulin Rouge. Yeah. Rouge. No matter how many times you translate it, the meaning stays the same. Red will, be, red will be pula in Tagalog as it is rouge in French. Different words, different letters, the same meaning. Same with the Bible. Translation does not mean that the meaning is changing. It's just being made understandable to that particular language group. Friends, these are dark times for Christianity. We are living in a very precarious, perilous time. Have you heard of the bill C-367? If you have read the news, raise your hand. That's dangerous. This is a threat to Christians' free speech. Why? Because if, they'll, if this bill is passed it would make illegal to quote scripture to defend biblical marriage, sexuality, and other Christian values. Expressing biblical guidelines for these matters would be deemed as hate speech and therefore a criminal offense. You could be sent to prison by simply saying, wives, submit to your own husbands. I'm just glad I already went through that. I don't have to say it again. You talked about that last year. I don't have to say it again. So I can go unscathed, right? Friend, my friends, trying to establish a spiritual confirm. Conversation these days is already an uphill battle. And now, with this, with this bill, if it ever passes into a law, it could be a crime to stand up for what the Bible teaches as the truth. Not only is its reliability put into question, but its motives are now being challenged as well. Peter Paul and John and the other biblical writers and the first century Christians, they faced a formidable enemy in the Roman Empire. They died defending for what they believed was true. And now 2,000 years later, 
we are as a spiritual family still met with strong opposition. The world wants to silence us because it wants us to subscribe to its own ideas and philosophies. But if you love God, you cannot afford to be silent. I can't. I cannot be silent about this. Like, it's like, like a fire shut up in my bones. It just resonates. I am furious. We have to speak. We have to speak out and out loud. We have to stand up for what the Bible says as true. We have to believe what the Bible says. And today, here's the declaration. The Bible is God's word. It's not a fable. It's not a myth. It's not a legend. It's not an old wives' tale. It is God's word. It is the very piece of literature that is needed by this rapidly decaying planet, both physically and morally. It is the one book that can save people's souls and change their lives. And my friends, this is not the time to be silent. Again, this is not the time to be silent. You have to speak. You have to fight for what is right. And it is only right and fitting for your friends and loved ones and neighbors to hear about Jesus because only Jesus can give them life and life that is full and abundant, life that is truly everlasting. Apart from Christ, there is no absolute way for them to go to heaven. 